for me, the unique thing when I look at it even now is uh, when, I, when I watch a film like Lady and the Tramp, it's not a film about dogs. It's a film told from the dog's point of view. And like what John was just saying, everything we figured out in terms of design and even a lot of character, certainly a lot of gags, came from the fact that they were real toys and they treated each other like real toys. They were adult toys as well, like John was saying earlier. But everything about the film, from the lighting and cinematography, to the design and how they saw the world, the scale of things, was from a toy's point of view. It's taken for granted now, but if you watch the film with that in your head, it's remarkable. You know, I, I still am kind of floored by that. It, it's, it's actually an easy thing to do and an incredibly hard thing to do. <laughs> you're also creating a new cinematic language, and I know you, you were doing lighting, Galen, but camera sort of ties into lighting, and, and there were decisions made about what the camera platform would be, and I noticed that we take it for granted now, but, but the camera, you could do anything with a camera, but you chose to ground the camera work and the lighting as though it were... Uh, a live a live action feature. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. That that was one of the first things that you had said was we are not doing flying logos. We are making a movie, which for for those of us, you have to realize back then um, the the people who were doing dealing with the technology were technologists. We were not filmmakers at the time. We didn't understand film language. We were simply you know doing whatever we were told in terms of trying to just get graphic images on the screen by programming as quickly as we could to, to get the pictures made. And so it's like, we're not doing flying logos. We're doing a real camera. What does, what does that mean? We had no clue what that meant. And so you're going into, you know, the study of lenses and the study of cameras and, and how, how do cameras work? And it was, it was all just really a, a big mystery. And we were learning along the way. And, and it was really just John keeps saying, it's not flying logos. It's a film, and a film is shot from a camera. Like, even even the idea of, a, of the camera being on a tripod, for, there were a lot of shots in Toy Story where the, the, where the tripod is attached to the camera is actually just behind the lens, and it, you know we've kind of moved it back a bit since then. Little things like that, they make a huge difference. It's also hand-drawn animation. It's two-dimensional, and our, our images are projected in two dimensions, so you want that clarity. But the thing that the, the lighting and the textures brought to it was... This, it's not live action and it's not hand-drawn animation. It's somewhere in the middle. It's almost like a, 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 an amalgam of all of those things and theater, you know, uh, because uh, everything's kind of presented in a theatrical way. You know? We said, you know, we would always talk about that, that what we're creating is somewhere between hand-drawn animation and live action. But it's not in one place for every aspect of the film. We would always say that the design of what we're doing is a little closer to hand-drawn animation, and it's a caricatured world. We never, ever, ever wanted the audience to look up on the screen and think we were trying to reproduce reality. We had a saying back in the days, because um, everybody was, in, was trying to create computer animation tools to, to do something that looked absolutely real. And we always said that reality is just a convenient measure of complexity meaning that it, you use that as a tool to create something that's absolutely real. Great, I have that tool. Now I'm going to step back from reality, produce something that the audience from every single frame knows this doesn't exist, and then make it look as real as possible. And that's where the design of the world was always very cartoony. But, as John was saying, the, the camera work, the understanding of, of the lighting, of the you know, camera work, we really wanted... Um, to, and we've studied deeply um, the limita what we're used to watching a motion picture film up on the screen is based, what feels right, is based upon the limitations of the filmmakers have had for, for, for decades and decades and decades of these large cameras on dollies, on cranes, on things like that. They couldn't move that camera around. It wasn't until the Steadicam came along that they, the filmmakers could actually move the camera in unique and different ways. And so, so we were always striving to kind of understand the film grammar that was used based upon the limitations of, of the camera. And, and so that's what we governed all of our camera moves. The other thing is, is that one of the inventions that Pixar did was based upon the need for motion blur, right? Motion blur, you know, in a motion picture camera, 
it's got the, the, the shutter, unlike your, your, your um, SLR or something like that that kind of goes, the, the, motion, the, the camera has basically a spinning wheel inside a 35 millimeter camera. And it, they call it a 180 degree shutter. Half of that wheel is open, half of it's closed. As it's spinning, it goes to, you know, 20, basically the equivalent of 24 frames a second. And while, while the, 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 the part of the wheel that's solid is over the film plane, that's when it's advanced, and the film stops, and it, it goes around, and it's the open part of the wheel that's turning exposes the film. And so the shutter speed of 35 millimeter is always exactly the same. It's not like your, your, your camera at home that you can change it. It's always exactly the same. Therefore, when you're watching a movie, there's a certain amount of motion blur that is always consistent. And without it, it doesn't look convincing. It doesn't feel like a film. In early computer animation, it was all crystal clear. No matter how fast something was moving, it was all crystal clear. And it never felt like a movie. It never felt like a movie. And, and one of the things that Ed, Ed and his team developed was, was the ability to do motion blur, which actually, the same technology led to depth of field. Yeah, the, the, uh, there's a physiological reason why there's a problem, why you need the motion blur. It was, in fact, the use of motion blur with optics that, uh, where, where ILM was capturing the motion blur of real spaceships against it and then having this great science behind maintaining that motion blur all the way through the optical matting. But it was very difficult. And we knew that in order to have... That's what made like Star Wars so unique in what was done because it was all the spaceships were flying around it had true motion blur. And it was, other than that, it would have, you would have seen this sort of doubling up of the, of the edge, even though you wouldn't notice it uh, consciously, but subconsciously, you know something's wrong. We had to solve the problem to make it uh, so that computer graphics could be used in filmmaking, but in doing so, we also enabled the special effects revolution. And it was that motion blur that was the difference. And when you, uh, and when you do the opposite, which is using a, like a 90 degree shutter or a skinny shutter, that's the opening of Saving Private Ryan where it all feels very dreamlike and chattery. So what they're trying to do is, is make it feel as organic as possible, but and, also and using squash and stretch right. also, which is another thing that you would Well, make. that's where in the animation and the timing and everything like that, again, we're on the spectrum between hand-drawn animation and, and live action, are we? Well, in the animation, it's all directly, you know, using all the, the principles of animation that Walt Disney and the Nine Old Men and all the great animators at Disney you know, kind of invented. We also studying Chuck Jones was a mentor of mine and studying the great animation of Ken Harris and all of the, the Warner Brothers cartoons. And, and we wanted to achieve that in, in what we were doing. So that's where, that's where this uniqueness of what Toy Story was in this computer animation. It was a movie. It was lit. It was dimensional. We had cameras moving around through things. We, we had steady cam kind of shots all that stuff, and it felt like a movie, yet they were cartoony, and they were moving like cartoons, and yet I could touch them. They were plastic, you know, and it was all that, that kind of uniqueness, because again, understanding the limitations of what the medium was at that time, and creating, you know, the characters and the storytelling and everything, because, you know, frankly, everything looked like plastic, so we made the main characters made of plastic, Buzz Lightyear, you know, organic, especially ground planes, was impossible to do at that time. So luckily, toys are found in kids' rooms, which are all flat floors. So it lent itself. It's our knowledge of the limitations of the medium lent itself to the subject matter. But everything else was like we had to invent, you know? And, and, and it, was, it was incredible. We would kind of, you know, something in the story, we would look at each other and how were, are we going to do that now? Yeah, everything was done programming-wise initially. I mean, we we placed lights by writing code. Um, there there were no interactive programs to place things. So you would you would write a line of code that would place a light and try to aim it and try to set its color and its breadth. And then you'd hit a button and you'd go get a cup of coffee. And then you'd come back and you would look at the image and say, "Wow, that's not quite right." And then you'd go back and you open the program and you'd change the line of code and it was just, it, it, it's hard for people to imagine. I, I remember when we, we got our first interactive modeling program and the first thing I got to model was the Pizza Planet truck. And it was 
the notion that you, you could take a mouse and click a point and then the point would show up on the screen. Right, mind blowing. <laughs>